Hello everybody and happy Halloween. That is the last time I will say that this year. That's crazy. I know. It's already November. Halloween's over, but we have one more video for you guys today. One more. It's been a wild ride. It's been so much fun. It's also been stressful and exhausting, but the fact that I was able to put out so much content in the month of October, share all of this with you guys, the response I got from you guys makes my heart so, so happy. You have no idea. The positivity, the excitement, like it was what kept me going. I promise you. There was times when I wanted to stop, but then I would just scroll through the comments of the past Halloween video and see your genuine excitement, your genuine enthusiasm, and it made me so excited and enthusiastic myself, and it made me realize that you guys are looking forward to it, you guys are depending on it, and in a way, I was depending on it too. It was so much fun, but next Halloween, I'm gonna start planning and preparing for next Halloween way further, like probably January is when I'm gonna start writing my Halloween scripts for next Halloween because it was just not enough time and I ended up, you know, coming down to the wire and it's definitely gonna be better planned next year. But I think for a first Halloween, I think it went really well. I mean, in my opinion, I think it was successful. So thank you guys so much for, for being here. But we're gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end. First, let's talk about our case for today. As a warning, this video does contain information about violence towards children. I'm not going to be showing any graphic pictures or going into any great detail, but I did want to give you a full advance warning and give you full disclosure right up front. I spent a lot of time researching crimes and cases that are absolutely horrific, and this one even I had a tough time with. But if you will trust me and allow me to tell you this story, knowing I'm not just going to throw things in for dramatic effect or purposely try and upset you, I promise, as always, to be as respectful as possible. This is the story of Nima Louise Carter. This is also the story of the Carpenter twins, and we're gonna see how their two stories intertwined in the end. But first, we're gonna talk about Nima, a 19-month-old baby who disappeared from her crib on Halloween night in 1977. Nima had been born on March 26, 1976, to her parents, Rose and George Carter. She was described as having these beautiful, lively, coal black eyes, and she was a quiet, laid-back child, but that was because she was always observing her environment, always watching and trying to learn. She lived with her parents in Lawton, Oklahoma, and from what anyone looking in from the outside could tell, they were a small, happy, and normally functioning family. Both George and Rose Carter had full-time jobs. George Carter was an accountant for the Comanche Tribal Office in Lawton. But on the evening of October 31st, 1977, Nima's parents put her down to bed at about 10.30 p.m. They placed her in her crib wearing just a little red t-shirt and a diaper. They tucked her in, they kissed her goodnight, and they left the room. They heard her crying as soon as they'd turned out the light and closed the door to her room, but this was their first child. They weren't trying to spoil her. This was a time when parents were told the more you held your babies and the more you coddled them, the more you were spoiling them. So for the most part, when she cried at night, they let her cry it out until she fell asleep, and she usually did. Essentially, parents who practice this technique believe that if the baby cries when he or she is, is trying to go to sleep, every time the parent goes in and soothes the child or picks the child up, the child will learn that if they cry, their parents will come, so they will never learn how to fall asleep on their own. They'll always need the aid of a parent or a caregiver. Eventually, Rose and George heard Nima's cries stop, and they assumed she'd fallen asleep and they too fell asleep for some reason in the living room of their home. The next morning, George went into the bathroom to shave before work, as he usually did, and his wife, Rose, poked her head into the bathroom and asked him, do you know where the baby is? Now this may seem like a strange question to ask about a 19-month-old who you put to bed in her crib the night before. Where else could she possibly be? But apparently Nemo was something of an escape artist. She was a very curious and smart and adventurous baby, and she had this habit of taking the kitchen drawers out and stacking them on top of each other so she could climb on them and hide in the kitchen cabinets. So I suppose that her parents weren't too alarmed to find the small child missing from her crib that November 1st morning. George continued shaving after chuckling about his daughter's cheekiness, 
And Rose went off to find the baby and give her breakfast. But before long, Rose was back in the bathroom, more panicked this time. She told George she could not find the baby anywhere, so George went to help her look for Nima. They looked everywhere. They looked in the kitchen cabinets. They looked in closets. They looked under beds. They looked out by the doghouse. They looked in the field behind their backyard. But Nima was nowhere to be found. They ran from room to room yelling their daughter's name, but Nima didn't tumble out of her hiding place with her little baby bed head and her bright, lively coal eyes laughing at her parents' worry. Nima Louise Carter was gone, and all that was left to show that there'd been a baby in that crib the night before was her favorite blanket, her favorite stuffed animal, and the bottle she'd been drinking when she was put to bed. On Wednesday, November 2nd, the Daily Oklahoman published a small article on the front page right under a headline reporting possible snowfall headed for the Panhandle area. The article was titled, Lawton Tot Haunt Grows, and it discussed the family offering a $1,000 reward for any information that brought the little girl back to them. Audrey Carter, Nima's grandmother, stated, I think maybe she might be trapped somewhere. She's so little and frail. And that was obviously a big concern because if Nima had somehow managed to get out of her crib and leave the house and she was lost with the cold front coming in, she wouldn't last long out on her own in the wilderness. She needed to be found. But there were not many leads to go on. The windows in Nima's room had been locked up tight and there was no sign of forced entry into the house. Obviously, this leads us to the first and most obvious suspects, which would be the baby's parents, but they cooperated with the police. They seemed truly worried about their daughter and about finding her, and they passed their polygraph tests with flying colors. George Carter felt that it had to be somebody who was familiar with their home, who'd been inside of the house. That way they would know where the furniture was arranged, where her room was, and they'd be able to get into the house and out of the house without bumping into something or alerting somebody of their presence. George also believed that whoever had taken Nima must have been hiding in her closet at bedtime, just waiting for her parents to put her to sleep and turn out the lights so that this person could creep in and take the baby out of her crib. Once this person had Nima, they would have had to have crept out of her room, down the hallway, down the stairs, and through the very same living room that Rose and George were sleeping in before sneaking out of the house, leaving the side door and the gate open. The police began searching abandoned buildings and urged the public to look on their properties for any sign of the baby, but they didn't find her. Thursday, November 3rd marked the fourth day Nima had been missing, and as temperatures dropped throughout Oklahoma, fears for the child's survival, if she was lost or trapped somewhere, increased. She wasn't even two years old yet. She only weighed 22 pounds, and she'd been dressed in a thin t-shirt. If the little girl was out there somewhere, the cold would make her odds of survival much less. The Carters did have some strange information for the police, though. George claimed that the previous April, around the 19th, their home had been burglarized, and pictures of their small daughter had been taken out of the house and scattered on the ground behind the shed. He also said that two months prior to the abduction, their home had been vandalized and the family pet dog had been poisoned. He believed that these incidences were related to Nima's disappearance, but the police didn't think that they were really connected at all. The days passed, and then the weeks, until November was drawing to a close. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and George and Rose Carter were most likely feeling that they didn't have much to be thankful for, and it would get so much worse. On November 23rd, 1977, a Fort Sill soldier was at a friend's house doing some laundry. He walked across the street to get some cigarettes from the laundromat, and on his way back across the street to his friend's house, he decided to walk through an abandoned building that was located next door to where his friend lived. In the kitchen of this dilapidated and abandoned duplex that was located a mile away from where the Carters lived, this soldier found the baby's body on the floor of the kitchen next to an open blood-splattered refrigerator. It was about 2.15 in the afternoon, and this Fort Sill soldier, whose name was Gary Goodall, he decided that he probably hadn't been the first person there. The police agreed with him, and it was decided that prior to Gary finding Nima's body, there'd been a group of children playing in this abandoned house, and they probably opened up the refrigerator, which her body had been in. When they saw her body, they got scared, and they knocked over the refrigerator in their rush to leave the house. 
It caused her body to tumble out of this refrigerator and end up on the kitchen floor of some dilapidated dark house all alone. The baby was wearing the same red shirt and diaper she'd been put to bed in on Halloween night, and her body was badly decomposed. They collected evidence from the scene, they lifted fingerprints, they got whatever they could find, but something about the way Nima had disappeared and been found struck a chord with law enforcement, as well as many people in the neighborhood. It was almost identical to another case from a year and a half before. On April 18th, 1976, two twin girls had been abducted from the living room of their grandmother's home while she vacuumed and they watched TV. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, broad daylight, and the two three-year-old girls just disappeared. These girls were named Mary Elizabeth Carpitcher and Augustine Lena Carpitcher. No one knew what had happened. There were no leads to follow, but luckily, three days later, some kids were playing in an abandoned house when they heard yells coming from a refrigerator. One of the girls who heard the shouts opened the door and Augustine, or Tina, spilled out. Tina told the kids who'd found her that a teenager named Jackie Robidoux had locked both her and her sister in that refrigerator. She had told them to be quiet and wait, and their aunt would come and get them soon and bring them to get ice cream. Jackie was friends with the Carpitcher twins' aunt, and she often babysat for the girls themselves. The girls had been locked in that refrigerator for three days, and somehow Tina Carpitcher managed to put her nose to a crack in the seal of the refrigerator and breathe just enough air to survive. Her sister Mary Elizabeth had not been so fortunate, and it was determined that she had died from asphyxiation and lack of oxygen. Now there's obviously so much here that we can and should be shocked by. These two toddler girls were taken from their home in the middle of the day while their grandmother was right there in the same house. They were led away by someone they knew and trusted, brought to an abandoned house, and shut into a refrigerator. And then they were left there to die. And before beginning to even try and unpack why somebody would do this, what the motive is for this, we have to first face the realization that Tina was locked into a very small space with her twin sister the closest person to her in the world, and somehow Tina managed to survive on tiny wisps of oxygen. But she had to lay there while she witnessed her sister, who wasn't able to get the oxygen, grow weaker and weaker until finally she fell asleep and she didn't wake up. I'm anticipating a question that I'll get in the comments, which is why didn't Tina share the crack of air with her sister? And I don't really know, but I think what you have to understand is a couple different things. One, these were three-year-old girls. They're babies. They don't have that kind of understanding. You have to also realize that at three years old, you don't have a lot of communication skills and you don't really understand what dying is. Tina understood enough about what she was feeling and craving to get that oxygen. But they were probably also locked in a very small space, and it's very possible that they were crammed in there together to the point where maybe Mary Elizabeth couldn't even get over to that small crack, or maybe they didn't know how to arrange themselves to get her over to that small crack, or maybe they didn't even realize that that was something they needed to do. And you also have to realize that Tina Carpenter is most likely still alive today, and can hear and read things about herself on the internet. So I don't want anybody in the comments to say like Tina should have let her sister have air and they both could have survived because that may be true, but they were three. They probably had no idea what was happening. So I definitely don't want any of that in the comment section here. I've seen it on the internet. I'm just disgusted by it. And I imagine that Tina Carpitcher struggles with the weight of that guilt every day of her life. They most likely cried and held each other. They most likely wondered when their aunt was coming to get them, to bring them to get ice cream. They thought they were going to have such a fun day, and it turned into the worst three days of their young lives. District Attorney Don Beauchamps gave a statement to the paper that they were questioning hundreds of people. They were hoping to find someone in the area who had seen the car picture twins before they'd wound up in that abandoned house. Two of these people were J.W. McKaig, a former Lawton fire chief, and his wife, Thelma. They lived close to the house where the twins had been found in, but they claimed that they hadn't seen anything. Nobody had seen anything. All they had was Tina Carpitcher's spontaneous statement when she'd emerged from that refrigerator that Jackie had done this to them. And when the police interviewed her later that evening, she said the same thing. Both Tina and Mary Elizabeth had human bite marks on their bodies. Two sisters, by each other's side since the moment they were conceived, were still together as they journeyed to the hospital. Tina, who was being treated for her wounds and for severe dehydration, 
and Mary Elizabeth for her autopsy. So obviously, the police had a suspect, but they'd gotten this suspect's name on the word of a traumatized three-year-old. And apparently, at least at this time, there wasn't enough actual evidence to point the finger at Jackie Robidoux. There was no physical evidence at the scene to tie anybody to the crime. And in fact, I'm sure there was, but this was 1976 and it was an abandoned house. So we really didn't have the technology at that point to get really good forensics off a scene. And an abandoned house where apparently kids in the neighborhood like to play in these abandoned houses. So there's gonna be kids running in and out, scraping their knees, leaving cans with you know DNA on it, leaving their hair all over the place. These abandoned houses were probably chock full of forensic evidence and it would most likely, especially in 1976, be hard to determine what evidence was there that was linked to the crime and what was there just from the multiple children and people who went in and out of these abandoned homes. But allegedly after an investigation the police found nothing and nothing happened to Jackie. For a while people looked at her sideways, people whispered about her potential involvement, but as it so often does, life went on. And before long, Jackie was getting babysitting jobs again. And for the most part, people had forgotten about the terrible event that had left one child without her life and one child sisterless. One of the families who began hiring Jackie to watch their daughter was the Carter family. Nima had been born the month before the Carpenter twins were abducted and Rose and George were pretty new to the neighborhood. At the time of Nima's abduction, they'd only lived there for 18 months. The Carters also enjoyed their recreational time. They were young parents, 27 years old, I believe. And of course, when you're a parent and you have a new baby, it's a hard transition from the single life where you could go where you wanted and do what you wanted to now you're responsible for a baby. And so you kind of have to curb those urges. Nima was a good baby, a smart baby, but a baby all the same, and a baby can put a cramp in your social life, especially when you're used to having an active social life. So if the Carters still wanted to have a social life, go out with their friends, go out with each other, drink a little bit or a lot, they'd need good, reliable childcare. In came Jackie Robidoux. Now, I'm not sure if the Carters knew about the car picture incident, but I would say on speculation, 100% yes, they did. It's said that the Carpitcher family and the Carter family were friendly with each other. They hung out. The Carter home was only 10 blocks away from the Carpitcher house. And it seems like they would have been moving into the neighborhood right when the twins were missing or shortly thereafter. So why did they choose to allow Jackie to babysit their daughter when it was suspected that she'd been involved in the death of another little girl? I have no answer for that. I can only assume as time went on, suspicion faded, it became distant, something in the past, and maybe nobody wanted to admit that a 17-year-old girl could do something like that. I mean, because really, if you ask yourself why, there's no answer. There's no, there's no clear answer to why she would do something like that. Maybe they really just needed a babysitter and so they convinced themselves that Jackie had nothing to do with what happened to the car picture twins. Either way, Jackie had babysat for Nima about 12 times before she disappeared, including the very night before her abduction. And it came out during the investigation that the Carters had asked Jackie to watch Nima that Halloween night. But she'd wanted to go play bingo with her friends. I guess everybody played bingo on Halloween night. I'm not really sure. I couldn't find any evidence of that, but it definitely is suggested several times that there was a bingo thing going on Halloween night and everybody was going to be playing bingo and Jackie wanted to be there too. She told George Carter that she couldn't do it and apparently he wasn't too happy about that. A clerk that worked at a convenience store right around the corner from the Carter home had seen and spoken to Jackie that Halloween afternoon. Apparently, both Jackie and George Carter had been in the store at the same time, and they'd had a short conversation before Jackie came up to the counter to check out, and George Carter left the store. When Jackie was up at the counter, she made a menacing comment about George Carter. It appeared that when Jackie had told George she couldn't watch Nima that night, he'd said something that had made her feel as if he was angry with her or disappointed with her, as if she was shirking her responsibilities. In the store that day, George had simply told Jackie he'd found another sitter for that night. Now, how did he communicate this information? Was it more of a, you know, I found another sitter tonight, go out, have fun, don't worry about it, we've got you covered? 
Or was it a, we found another sitter tonight, so we won't be needing your services anymore. Good day to you. Who knows? I'm not sure the way it was communicated and obviously based on how it was said and how it was relayed, Jackie would have taken it a different way. Or maybe she was just a sensitive person who took George's friendly reminder that he'd found another sitter that night as a direct insult. Who knows? Whichever way he meant it, Jackie took it negatively and she told the clerk, they said it was my job. Well, if that's the way he wants it, so be it. And then she left. So, I mean, I gather from that, that the Carters had asked her to babysit on Halloween. She said she couldn't and they were like, well, this is kind of your job. So she felt insulted by that. And now, you know, she's gonna lash out, strike back, kidnap their kid. And there was many similarities between the two cases that connected Jackie to both. Jackie had babysat for both families. She'd been inside of both homes and she would have been familiar with the inside of each house. All three girls had been abducted right from their home and all three were very young. The victims, as well as Jackie herself, all lived in the same neighborhood. They were all of Native American descent. Both the car pitchers and the Carters knew and were friendly with Jackie's family. All three girls were found in abandoned houses in refrigerators, and these two houses were different houses, but they were only a mile apart, and Jackie had been seen at both locations previously. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The police were confident that this time, Jackie Robidoux was not going to be fooling them, and she was not going to get away with her crimes. Somehow, Jackie had managed to escape punishment for her role in Mary Elizabeth Carpenter's death, but she was not gonna get away this time. I'm gonna answer another question that I anticipate you guys are going to have. When I said that they were all of Native American descent, I meant all three girls as well as Jackie. So often I'll see online people wondering if this was a targeted attack, a hate crime, because the girls were all Native American, but the perpetrator, Jackie, was Native American as well, and they lived, you know, in a Native American community. So the odds of these girls being targeted because of their ethnicity is really, really low, since Jackie also was Native American, and most of the people around were. Cecil Davidson, an investigator on the case, asked Jackie directly if she'd been involved. She sullenly told him no. She'd been playing bingo that night, but he remembers vividly the fact that she was looking everywhere but at him. She just could not make eye contact. Davidson also remembered that she seemed really angry about the fact that the Carters had even asked her to watch Nima that Halloween night when everybody else was going to be playing bingo. Like she was stuck on this whole, how dare they ask me to babysit when they knew I was going to be playing bingo like everybody else was. Still, even with her odd behavior, they could not get a confession. Jackie also mentioned that she didn't think the two cases were similar enough to indicate a pattern, which was a strange thing to say, almost like, yeah, I committed this first, you know, crime that you guys didn't catch me on, but this one I didn't, and it's not similar enough to even, you know, connect it to me because I'm responsible for this first crime. So she was almost like admitting that she'd been involved in the Carpenter twins incident, but using that as a way to prove that she wasn't involved with this situation, which was a strange thing to do. And it's also just a stupid thing to say because anybody with a brain can tell that these two cases, the Carpenter twins and Nima Louise Carter, were eerily similar. You could blame Nima's death on a copycat, but to say that the two cases didn't have enough in common to indicate a pattern is kind of ridiculous. But as in the first crime scene, this one, there was no physical evidence either, none that they could find. So there was nothing to tie Jackie physically to these crime scenes. The police were sure they had their guy or a girl, but the district attorney would not prosecute. He said there wasn't enough evidence. Another detective on the case who was named Ray Anderson was frustrated by the lack of evidence and he knew deep down, you know, that she was involved. She was connected to both of these cases. So he kind of made it his mission to connect her to at least one of them. He knew, given the lack of physical evidence, the only thing they could actually use against her was her own confession. So he brought her into the police station and they didn't get a direct confession from her, but they did get enough to prove she knew things about the car picture scene and the crime that they hadn't released publicly, that only the person who had been there would have known. Jacqueline Robidoux was arrested and charged with the first degree murder of three-year-old Mary Elizabeth Carpenter on October 19th, 1979. And while she sat in prison awaiting her trial, the state gathered together their forces to build their case and gather their witnesses. And two important witnesses did come forward. Remember J.W. McCaig and his wife, Thelma? 
Well, the day the Carpenter twins had been kidnapped, the couple had been outside putting new siding on their house, and Thelma had called JW's attention to a teenage girl dragging two smaller girls by the hands through a field toward the abandoned house where the Carpenter twins were eventually discovered. Here is verbatim what J.W. McCaig had to say about what he witnessed. I just glanced at her to see what it was. It didn't interest me that much. They acted to me like they were under protest, but I didn't want to get involved. So, Mr. J.W. McCaig, former fire chief, a man who had been responsible for saving lives, watched two little baby girls getting pulled into a house, clearly seeing that they were trying to get away. And he did nothing. For fear of what? Being rude? Being inconsiderate? Having people say that he put his nose where it didn't belong? Not getting his siding installed before the sun set? But if you think I'm being too hard on J.W. McCaig, just wait. Not only did he not interfere at the time, but later when it was discovered that the girls were missing, he did nothing. Again, and he was questioned by the police. Both he and Thelma were questioned by the police, and they didn't tell the police what they'd seen. This was before Tina had been discovered, most likely when both girls were still alive in that house, in that refrigerator. He claims he didn't bring it up because the police didn't ask him specific questions about the girls. If it's possible, I'm even more upset and disgusted with J.W. McCaig and his wife than I even am with Jackie Robidoux. These were grown adults, a man who had, you know, served as a public servant for most of his life. And I understand this was a different time, and it's just like we talked about in the Alphabet Murders video where, you know, people didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to step outside of their lane if they saw a kid getting spanked or a girl running down the highway away from a car that was chasing after her. They just assumed that it was their business or that family's business, and they didn't want to get involved. Maybe JW just thought that these girls had run away or run out of the house and their babysitter was dragging them home, kicking and screaming. I understand that. It wouldn't have been the way I would have handled it, but I understand that. But later, when two small girls are missing and the description of these two small girls that are missing matches the description of the two girls you saw getting pulled across the field by this teenage girl, then you say something, at least tell the police, and if it turns out to be nothing, it turns out to be nothing. But you didn't volunteer this information because the questions weren't specific enough for you? <sighs> That's despicable. And if they'd come forward with this information when the police were searching for the girls, it's more than likely the police would have gone into that abandoned house to check it out, they would have opened the refrigerator, and they would have found them both alive. So to you, J.W. McCaig. Electric chair. But that's all alleged speculation, my opinion, don't come for me. Covered my bases, let's move on. Apparently, Lawton law enforcement had even enlisted help from the New York Psychic Institute, and a psychic from there had asked the police to not tell her anything, not about who the victims were, not about who the suspect was, not even about what happened or what the crime was. She just wanted them to send her a piece of clothing worn by one of the victims. So they sent over the shirt that Mary Elizabeth had been wearing when she was found. When she had done whatever psychics do with these personal items of the victims, she came back and she said she'd had a vision. She told them, I can see the person walking along the street with two young girls. And she described what the street looked like, what the person looked like, and even what the suspect was wearing. The district attorney at the time, Dick Tannery, claimed it was an exact description of Jackie Robidoux. He said she hit one of the suspects to a T. It was so uncanny. It was scary when I heard it. Jackie had been 17 when she lured Mary Elizabeth Carpenter and Tina Carpenter away from their homes and locked them in a refrigerator. She was 20 when she stood in front of a judge and pled not guilty to first degree murder. She was locked up with a $75,000 bond, she went to prison, and she hired an attorney named Garvin Isaacs from Oklahoma City. Her trial began in February of 1982 and witnesses testified to a packed courtroom every single day for almost three weeks. The wonderful and special McKiggs testified. Augustine Williams, who was the grandmother of the car picture twins, she testified. Now, Augustine was their grandmother, but she'd adopted the girls when they were born, so they lived with her full time. And Augustine testified and told the court that Jackie was a friend of one of her daughters, that she'd often be at the house with the twins, with her friend, the twins' aunt. Sometimes they all went to movies together. She spent a lot of time with these girls. 
She also testified that her granddaughter had clearly said it was Jackie when she was removed from that refrigerator. The witnesses who were at the scene when Tina came out of the refrigerator also testified that she'd said Jackie's name as well as law enforcement who had interviewed her that night. They all testified that she said it was Jackie. Now Garvin Isaacs, who was Jackie's lawyer, questioned Miss Williams about what else she'd seen that day. Had she seen a van anywhere? And Miss Williams did admit that when she'd called the girls and she was looking for them that afternoon, she'd seen a van do a U-turn in front of her house, but she hadn't thought anything of it. Garvin Isaacs put forward the theory that it hadn't been Jackie Robidoux who had taken the girls. It had been another person, a young man named Jackie Burnett who drove a van. Now, of course, Jackie Burnett's like, well, how did I get pulled into this? I don't even know these people. I wasn't anywhere near there. I have nothing to do with this, but I know what Garvin Isaacs was doing. He was trying to throw reasonable doubt into the mix. He was trying to show the jury that it didn't have to be this Jackie who had done it because there was other people named Jackie in the world. And I'm sure all he really did for investigation was to find anyone else named Jackie that lived close by and then just kind of like use that person as a distraction. But the thing was these were three-year-old girls and they didn't know this Jackie guy. The only Jackie they knew was Jackie Robidoux, their babysitter. Augustine Williams also testified that Jackie Robidoux's grandmother, who was named Winnie, tried to get her to sign a statement in April of 1979 saying that Jackie hadn't put the twins in a refrigerator and obviously Augustine was like, I'm not gonna sign that. So Winnie gets up on the stand and she's asked about this agreement or paper that she asked the twins' grandmother to sign and of course, she knows nothing about it. She did nothing of the sort. And of course, little Tina Carpitcher, who was nine years old at the time, had to get up in front of a court and relive her experience in the refrigerator. And of course, Jackie's lawyer, Garvin, picked it apart. He said that it sounded rehearsed and that she'd been coached by her grandmother and by law enforcement on what to say in court and what to say to everybody. He said she was three years old at the time and couldn't possibly remember what happened when she was three six years later. He said she was just repeating what she'd been told happened. Little kids want to make people happy. They say and they do whatever it takes to make the grown-ups and the adults in their life happy and proud of them and that her whole testimony just wasn't reliable. Garvin Isaacs also attacked the family of the car picture twins, saying they were a family of parrots, whose default response under cross-examination was, I don't remember, or I don't know. He basically accused them of going along with whichever story the district attorney and the police wanted them to go along with. And I mean, some of that is not untrue. It was six years. Tina was three at the time. It's very unlikely that at nine she would remember specifically what happened when she was three. I mean, do any of you remember anything that happened when you were three? However, what I think Garvin Isaacs conveniently ignored was the fact that she'd made that statement spontaneously when she'd been let out of the refrigerator. The amount of time that passed and the age she was at the time that Jackie finally went on trial for this, it doesn't change the fact of what she said initially when coming out of the refrigerator to a group of kids who really have no motivation to lie. So that day and that night when her memory was fresh, she told these kids it was Jackie, her babysitter. And she told her grandmother it was Jackie, her babysitter. And she told the police it was Jackie, her babysitter. She didn't know this other Jackie guy. He may have lived in the neighborhood, but these were three-year-old kids. They didn't know everybody named Jackie who lived in their neighborhood. Jackie Robidoux was the only Jackie they knew and the only one that they would have been able to point the finger at. Two women who had been staying at the jail house while Jackie was staying there also testified and they said that she had on separate occasions bragged to them about committing these murders. The jury deliberated. They came back and they asked to hear some parts of recorded testimony over again. They went back and they deliberated some more. After almost 11 hours of this, the jury came back and told the judge that they just could not come to a unanimous decision and a mistrial was declared. Jacqueline Robidoux was released, but she did lose her lawyer. Garvin Isaacs quit once he realized that she either didn't have the money to pay her legal fees or just didn't want to pay her legal fees. She'd only paid about a third of them and there, there seemed to be no more payment in sight. Her new attorney, a court-appointed public defender, painted this really sad story about Jackie. You know, she was living off of welfare. She was taking care of both her grandmother and her mother who were ill and needed help. She had a three-year-old son now, apparently at some point between her being released or her being out on bail or something happened, she got pregnant and she had a three-year-old son. 
So she's going on trial again, a second trial for the same crime. And she's got a three-year-old and apparently she's the sole care provider for her mother and her, her grandmother who are both really ill. So the, the public defender is trying to paint a picture of a woman who's desperately needed and doesn't hurt people. She helps people. And I'm over here like, get her away from that three-year-old boy ASAP, right? Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go to jail. So during the second trial, the district attorney decided to introduce the case of Nima Louise Carter, even though Jackie hadn't been connected to it and hadn't been put on trial for it or accused of it really. She hadn't been formally charged for it at least. The district attorney said this shows a pattern. This shows that this woman's very dangerous and it's not just one kid. She will keep going. And now she was a mother. A mother to a child who was about the same age as her three other victims. Tina had to get up and testify again. At this point, this poor girl had retold her story and relived this tragedy roughly 15 times for juries and judges and police officers, and who knows how many times for psychiatrists and family members. The jury also heard from 69 different witnesses. They had been found by what is called the most extensive investigation in the county's history. During this trial, a 27-year-old man named Eugene Thompson was charged with attempting to influence a member of the jury. Now, who this man was, Eugene Thompson, I have no idea. I searched from everywhere, even newspapers.com, which always gives me like my most juicy hidden information. And I only found one article where he was charged for jury tampering and he was let out on a thousand dollar bail and his trial or a hearing was going to be scheduled and nothing else after that. Nothing before about him, nothing after, which I think is, is very strange, but I don't know who he was to Jackie or who he was to the car pitchers or the Carters. I don't know who he was connected with. And it's, it's a little strange to me that that information is something I can't find. So if anybody's familiar with this case and knows who he was and who he was trying to influence or why, let me know in the comments or shoot me an email. Either way, the jury went out to deliberate at 9.30 at night, and about six hours later, they came back with a guilty verdict, and Jackie Robidoux was sentenced to life in prison, finally. It's pretty clear to me that the right person went to prison for the murder of Mary Elizabeth Carpenter, even though she was never charged or answered for the death of Nima Louise Carter. Why did she do these things? I, I have no idea. I can't. I can't even. I really, I can't. There's there's the speculation path, and then there's the get into the mind of a psychopath and figure out why they might do things, and that's a path that, that leads you to, to become crazy, I think. So if we go on the speculation path and we ask ourselves, why did she do this? I think she was sick. I think she was mentally ill. I think she was a psychopath, somebody who just kills to kill. And a lot of people commit acts of violence against each other. A lot of people kill other people. But for the most part, you'll see that there's a motive to this. There's a reason. Even if the reason isn't a good enough reason to kill somebody, they still had a reason. Money, jealousy, what have you. What is the perpetrator getting? How do they benefit from killing this person? Are they going to have a windfall when they get the insurance money? Is their wife or husband cheating on them so they kill their wife or they kill their husband? Are they cheating on their husband and wife so they want to kill them to get them out of the way so they can have this new relationship? There are motives and there are reasons of why people kill other people. But why a 17 year old girl would go around her neighborhood systematically locking babies essentially into refrigerators until they asphyxiate and run out of oxygen, there's no motive. Like what's the reason? What are you gaining from that besides the sick pleasure of knowing you did it? And that to me makes her a crazy sociopathic, psychopath, whatever. I don't know the difference. You know, I didn't pay enough attention to Shane Dawson's documentary, but one of those. So I think a sociopath is like somebody who does things without feeling, you know, actual human emotion. Like they don't know what actual human emotion feels like. They just feel kind of empty and, you know, leveled out all the time. And so they have to kind of watch other people and parrot them and mimic them to behave like a normal human so people think they're normal and they have emotions maybe maybe she was like that maybe she just literally felt nothing for anybody and she did this to just get a thrill or to just feel something i don't know guys Ugh, the speculation path got dark and these are the most dangerous types of people i think because there's no rhyme or reason there's no understanding why they do it 
or where they're gonna strike next. They just do it because they like it or they want to or they feel compelled to. So you don't even really know what they're gonna do next or who they're gonna hurt next. It's really hard to, to kind of keep tabs on it. So I definitely think she ended up in the right place. Now, is there any chance that Jackie was not responsible for this? I don't think so. There was really no other angles. There was really no other suspects. Her attorney tried to paint it as like a vendetta from the police who didn't get her the first time, so they were gonna get her eventually. And when Nima Luis was taken and ended up, you know, dead in that refrigerator, they found the way they were gonna get her. Unless there was a copycat that came in and took Nima and was just copying the murder or the attempted murder of the Carpetra twins, I can't imagine how it could be anybody else. Years later, Rose Carter died, never knowing what happened to her baby daughter. George Carter is still alive today and he still remembers his little girl. In a 2007 article published in the Oklahoman Times, he said, you know, I've learned to appreciate all the little things. When Nemo was a baby, I look back at all the time I wasted, partying and drinking. Now, at the time of this article, George said that he was a recovering alcoholic, so, you know, he'd seen the error in his ways, and he wished, obviously, that he'd spent more time with his daughter instead of worrying about when he was gonna be able to get out of the house next or who was gonna babysit her, and obviously, hindsight is 2020. We all have these regrets. I think everybody, you know, ends their life in some way wishing that they'd spent more time with their family and their children. I, I think that's pretty common. The Carters have been criticized for using the cry it out method. We most likely know it today as the Ferber method, but back in this 1976, it wasn't called the Ferber method yet. It was basically just like normal parenting. And that's what I want people to understand. That was normal parenting. It's been speculated that they'd been out drinking that night. They were drunk, they passed out in the living room. And that's how uh, Jackie was able to sneak past them with Nima because they were passed out. I don't know if that's true. I have no knowledge or evidence that they had been drinking that night or that they'd gone out that night or that they passed out drunk in the living room. This is all speculated online. And honestly, I don't really appreciate that kind of speculation. We know that George and Rose had nothing to do with what happened to their daughter. So obviously parents and people are flawed. Sometimes we have a couple glasses of wine and maybe we're sleeping a little bit heavier than we normally would. And our baby wakes up crying and we don't hear them and the next day we feel guilty. Or, you know, maybe the morning after we've had a couple too many drinks, we feel really tired and we sleep in, we forget to make Sunday morning breakfast. You know, things like that happen. It's normal. Parents are not perfect and it's pretty impossible to be a perfect parent 100% of the time because you're always working when you're a parent, right? You're never off. You're never not a parent. There's never a day where you can be like, I have no parental responsibilities. I'm not a parent. Because even if your kids aren't with you, you still have things you have to do, like make doctor's appointments or just make sure you're being a good role model in general. There's never a day off, it's exhausting. But we make mistakes, we do stupid things, and in the end, when we are older and we are parents, we understand why our parents, you know, seemed perfect to us for many years, and then we, we saw flaws as we got older, and it stunned us, right? When we saw the flaws in our parents, we were like, wait, my parents are supposed to be perfect. If the parents aren't perfect, who is? And then we were all upset when we realized that our parents were just humans. I don't like blaming the parents in this situation. To me, this isn't a Madeline McCann kind of situation where we don't really know whether the McCanns were involved with what happened to Madeline and you know they left their kids alone in a foreign country in a strange room in a strange house to go eat dinner at like some other location where they weren't even there. That's completely different. And if you're a parent, you have most likely at one point tried the cry it out method. My first two kids were great sleepers, but Bella, oof, not, not, not good. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. For a year of my life, a year and a half maybe, I didn't sleep. This girl would not sleep through a night. She would wake up at least six to eight times screaming as if she was being like attacked by a monster. So you're ripped from your sleep, you know, six to eight times a night by somebody screaming. It was traumatic for both of us. And so I brought her to the doctor and I was like, something's wrong. I, I think something's wrong with my baby. She doesn't sleep. She wakes up all the time. I think she has maybe a food allergy. 
Is she in pain? Does something hurt on her? Something's got to be wrong. I was desperate. I was exhausted. I was at the end of my rope. And the doctor looked at me and said, your baby's just a bad sleeper. You know, put her in her crib at night, let her fall asleep naturally. And if she's got to cry it out, cry it out. So I, I tried this, guys. I tried this. And it was uh, traumatic. It was very traumatic for me. Even more traumatic than waking up six to eight times a night with a baby screaming as if they're being attacked by the boogeyman. So... I couldn't do it. I mean, I couldn't. I sat outside of her room and Bella, Bella could cry for hours. She wasn't the 15, 20 minutes cry and then pass out from exhaustion. She's got lungs on her and endurance like you wouldn't believe. She cried for hours. I did it one night. I sat outside of her room and I sobbed. We were both crying, her inside the room, me outside the room. I sobbed and I sobbed and finally I went in and I picked her up and whatever. Now I still rock her to sleep and I put her in the crib when she's still awake so that she gets used to falling asleep by herself, but I still rock her to sleep every night and sing to her and give her a bottle. I like that time with her because it's literally the only time she's not all over the place and wriggling around and on the go and I can just snuggle with her. But even though it wasn't the best for me and my family, the cried out or the Ferber method, I have lots of friends who say that they've tried it and it works just fine. It's a case by case basis. It matters on the family. It matters on the child. It matters on the parents. And if they're strong enough to endure, I was not. This was how the Carters chose to raise their daughter and nobody has the right to judge them for that. Even if they had a couple drinks that night, who cares? How were they supposed to know some teenage psychopath was going to be sneaking in their house, hiding in their closet and kidnapping their daughter? They would have no knowledge of that. No one, even the most perfect parent could have prepared for that. And there's a long history as to why many people believe letting the baby cry it out is unnatural and goes against human biology. Children sleeping on their own, in their own rooms and in their own beds, it's a fairly modern concept. In prehistoric times, our ancestors knew that a crying baby would attract hungry predators, so they slept beside their children and nursed on demand so the babies could be quickly soothed. But in the late 19th century, a fear of germs caused doctors to warn parents to have as little physical contact with their children as possible and to sleep in separate beds to avoid the spread of disease and infection through shared breath. And then overlying became a thing, which was babies being suffocated or smothered by their parents on purpose and then the parents saying they'd accidentally rolled on them or done it in their sleep. So the church actually outlawed co-sleeping for a while as it became more and more common. But even in some countries and some cultures today, co-sleeping is still practiced and those who practice it have, you know, proof or evidence or studies that back up why they believe it's a good thing and the best thing for their child. So it's just a personal preference as a family, as a parent, how you want to, to raise your child. And interestingly enough, well, at least in 2007, when George Carter was interviewed, he's not sold on the fact that Jackie Robidoux was involved in what happened to his daughter, which I find very strange, but that's just my opinion. He said that Jackie was great with Nima and that every time Jackie came over, Nima was always so happy to see her and would run to her and throw her arms around her, which to me is just incredibly sad. That, even, that makes it even sadder. So maybe if she'd been doing drugs at that time, she would have done things that she normally wouldn't have done under the influence of drugs. And to me, I mean, I, I haven't done a lot of drugs in my life, so I don't know personally. What drug does that? As far as I'm concerned, the most that the drug would do is just bring out your natural, like, desires that you already had. It would just kind of lower your inhibitions and make you more impulsive to do kind of the stuff that you already wanted to do. And I don't even know if I believe that whole drug thing. Probably just an excuse from good old Jackie Rubidoux. Ruby Roo. Rubidoux. Robidoux? Whatever. Jackie died of liver cancer in prison on April 26th, 2005. And I just think it's a little bit karma and a little poetic justice that she happened to die the same month that she kidnapped the Carpenter twins and murdered one of them, allegedly. I mean, not allegedly, she was convicted of it, so I don't have to cover my ass. So basically, no one will ever get the chance to find out why she did this. But George Carter says he doesn't need to know the who or the why, because whoever did this to his daughter, he's already forgiven them, which makes him a much better and bigger person than I ever could be. Obviously, he has to forgive them in order to move on with his life, without that hate and sadness burning inside of him. But at the end of the day, we have two small girls, babies essentially, who had their lives stolen away from them senselessly for no clear reason, because honestly, like I said, what could be the reason for that? And this happened to them in the most 
terrifying and horrific way. They, they would have no way of knowing what was happening or why they were there. They would have no way to comprehend that they were dying as their oxygen ran out. All they knew is that they were cold, scared, hungry, and they were getting more and more tired as the minutes went by. All they knew was they wanted their mom, they wanted warm arms around them, and a lullaby being sang softly into their ear as they were rocked to sleep in a safe place, in a warm place, in a familiar place. It's the same thing that every baby wants and deserves. And who knows how long Nima was trapped into that refrigerator before she succumbed to the darkness. I mean, her body was found a month later. We don't know how long it took for her to, to run out of oxygen and die. And I mean, at least Tina and Mary Elizabeth had each other. Nima was completely alone and she wasn't even two years old yet. Hug your kids tight today, folks. And if you don't have kids, hug your niece or your nephew, or give your neighbor a high five, or if you see some kid running around a park, having a great time being a kid, and you know just enjoying youth and life, give them a thumbs up, or just enjoy watching it, and smile to yourself. You know, kids are pure, they just love life, they are on the beginning of their path in life, like they're, they're at the beginning of their journey, and that's what I love about kids, it's like this blank canvas, and they could literally go on to be anything. And every kid I look at, I'm like, what are you going to do? What are you going to be? What's going to happen in your life? I could be looking at the next president of the United States. I could be looking at the next Bill Gates. I could be looking at the next Oprah. Like it's just so cool. It's like when you open a book at the beginning and that book could be anything and you can't wait to find out what it is. Kids are special like that and they have this unique way of making us feel more shiny and bright and new. Being a kid is precious and special and magical and it's just a devastating shame that some of them never get to experience that journey. Let me know in the comments what you think. Halloween's officially over. I'm really sad. I mean, I'm tired, like I said, but I'm still sad. It feels like something really exciting and fun and great is coming to an end but we're gonna have more stuff ahead of us. I've got a cult series coming up, serial killer series coming up. I'm gonna be doing coffee and crime times regularly while I work on research um, for the bigger videos and you guys are not gonna be rid of me. And we have next Halloween to look forward to, but I do wanna give some shout outs and special thanks to those who really made Halloween possible. First we have Philip Park who did the animation for the Halloween intro and I'll put his contact information in the description box if you guys are interested in reaching out to him to do some animation for you and he's actually the husband of one of my subscribers I believe from Ireland but what a great guy what a great guy to work with and what a good job he did. I also want to thank Sam Polizzi and Johnny Cummings they did the sound effects and the music for the intro and Johnny Cummings is actually the same um, artist that you'll hear he sings Chemical Love which everybody loves. It's the intro to Coffee and Crime. And um, so they were amazing. They literally came in clutch and did the sound effects and the music like in a very short time period. I'm, I'm very impressed. Authors that I have spoken to during research for this video and there are two videos that I haven't put out yet that I was planning to do for Halloween but I needed to do some more research and those two cases are um, The Witch of Del Rey and H.H. Holmes. So those videos will probably be coming out within the next month as well. But I spoke to Chicago author Adam Seltzer who wrote a great book about H.H. Holmes and he helped me a little bit more on the phone, kind of clearing things up, took some time to help me out amazing. I also spoke to Karen Divis who wrote the book The Witch of Del Rey and this case is crazy guys. I cannot wait to give you both of these videos but they were so kind of time intensive and I just kept finding more stuff so I wanted to keep looking and, and researching so I could give you the best video on the topic that I could but Karen helped me out as well. She's the author of that book and she was great on the phone. Adam and Karen were both great. Of course Marita Woolward Crandall who helped me out with the Casket Girls case, an author from New Orleans who wrote the book New Orleans Vampires and I also want to thank one of my subscribers Celeste who hooked me up with Marita because they're both from New Orleans and they knew each other so Celeste obviously is amazing. If you guys don't know who Celeste is she has a YouTube channel she also has a great Instagram follow her on Twitter I'll put all her stuff in the description box so you can follow her she does tarot cards she's awesome. I want to also give a big thank you to my husband Adam if he had not stepped up and helped me out this month even though I know he was very busy 
um, this wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have had the time to research and write scripts and record and edit because literally all month I just recorded and edited and edited and recorded and it was just this never ending cycle to the point where my computer crashed. So I had to get a new one. But Adam was there. I mean, there was times when he would just, you know, see that I was stressed out and he'd give the kids a bath or get them ready for bed or take Bella for the whole day so that I could get some uninterrupted work done. So he really helped me out. My mother-in-law, obviously, for taking um, Bella during the day on Mondays and Fridays so I could record and edit. My kids for putting up with me because I know there was times when I was grouchy and there was times when I probably just uh, was too tired to even fully function as a human being. My parents Patreons who were so awesome and understanding because I was MIA for the last two months and I definitely didn't give them everything they deserved, but they were, you know, there for the right reason. They were behind me. They were supporting me. My Patreons are amazing people. And I, I really don't know how I got so lucky to just find such a great group of people. Obviously, to all of you out there watching, giving me encouragement, like I said, that was exactly what I needed to keep going. Your encouragement, your love, your support, it was everything to me. And of course, our sponsors who helped out during Halloween. We had the lovely and beautiful Magellan TV. We had a function of beauty. We had Ana Luisa jewelry. We had, of course, Hunt a Killer so much fun. We also had Audible and Glasses USA and these sponsors really came through in a pinch and helped me out and I just appreciate every subscriber, every Patreon, every sponsor. Thank you guys so so much. And on that note, I'm going to throw in a quick plug for our sponsor of today's video, which is Haunt a Killer. It doesn't matter if Halloween's over, guys. We still need some creepy in our life. If you haven't signed up for Haunt a Killer yet, you should definitely try it. I am working on the next box now. I'm so excited. I'm definitely like this close to figuring out who, what, where, when, and how in this season. And then I'm really ready to just get on to the next one. I'm not going to give you any spoilers in case you're working on this season still, but it's going to be good. It's going to surprise you. Okay, guys, thank you so much. In the description box, you're going to find the links to everybody I just talked about. You'll also find the links to Ana Luisa Jewelry. This this necklace that I've worn like every single day is Ana Luisa Jewelry. I love it. You'll also find the links to Live Love Polish, which was another of our sponsors this month. The link to Magellan TV, a link to Hunt a Killer, a link to everybody, you know, everybody, just check it out. If you really want to support the channel and if you were ever thinking of doing any of these sponsors, you know, just check it out now. Now's the time. Thank you guys so much for being with me during Halloween. I appreciate you. I love you. It's going to be so weird next time we talk because I'm not going to say happy Halloween and I'm not going to say stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky. This is the last time I'm going to say it for a year, but stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky, and I'll see you next time. Bye. I've been thinking about the way your smile lights up a room Like a sliver of the moon in the summer sky A laugh that could settle the seas I thought you a fleeting dream 